So um, good afternoon, everyone. It's just about afternoon. We're just starting the afternoon here um, in Eastern time. I know many of you are in different parts of the country or perhaps even different parts of the world. I am Kirsten Hammond, and I am the director of the School of Politics, Security, and International Affairs. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event on reflections on Kurdish politics. Before we start with our program, however, I would like to take a few minutes to remember Dr. Najmaldin Karim, who passed away just a few weeks ago. Dr. Karim's generous donation made it possible to establish UCF's Kurdish Political Studies program. He was a gifted neurosurgeon and a leading Kurdish politician. In the obituary, the Washington Post called Dr. Karim a one one-man lobby for Kurdish interests on Capitol Hill. There is much to say about Dr. Karim and his advocacy for improving the lives of the Kurdish people. And I would like to invite some friends of our program who have known Dr. Karim for a long time to share a few words with us before we start um, the speaker event and discussion about Kurdish politics. And so first off, I would like to welcome Ambassador Peter Galbraith, who has um, known Dr. Dr. Karim for for many time uh, for many years, and just ask him to share a few words um, about Dr. Karim with the audience. Ambassador Galbraith, are you there? Peter is muted. I'm, Peter, I'm not muted now. Okay, Excellent. great. Thank you. Okay. Well, first, uh, I, I'm honored to be asked to say a few words about Najmaldin Karim. Uh, his contribution to Kurdistan, to U.S.-Kurdish relations, and to my own life can't be overstated. Uh, I think you know the outlines of the story. He came to the U.S. country as a refugee. Uh, he had to requalify as a doctor. Uh, he, as part of that requalification process, he was in uh, Georgetown, uh, uh, at George Washington University Hospital when, when Ronald Reagan was shot, and he worked on James Brady, the press secretary who was shot in the head. Uh, and uh, then he, he went on to become one of the best um, neurosurgeons and, and strongest practices. And he, uh, he, he had a, a home in Silver Spring. It was so far out of Washington that when I went there, as I often did, I always felt I'm going to Kurdistan. Um, but uh, he, uh, he, um, he could have had a comfortable life just as a, a very successful doctor. But he never uh, gave up on Kurdistan, uh, even in the darkest day. And, and we met at absolutely the darkest time in 1987, at the very beginning of the Anfal campaign. Uh, he read a, a few paragraphs in a report I'd written, or I'd been a co-author of, on the war in the Gulf. It was really focused on the tanker war and other things, but I'd gone to Kurdistan and, and seen the destruction. And he came in to, to meet me. And he really is the person who educated me about uh, Kurdistan. Uh, and, but not just me, but Washington. Uh, and he brought uh, and introduced to Washington to people like Jalal Talabani and Hoshir Zabari, Masoud Barzani, Nechavan Barzani, Sami Abdul Rahman, and, and so many more. And, uh, you know, I, I, the Kurds were, were a relatively unknown community, uh, largely because they have no state. And uh, Najmuddin went out and, and made sure they got, got better known. I have to say, I, I've had a number of uh, the most important events in my life, um, uh, including uh, uh, traveling along the Iraq-Turkey border to document the use of chemical weapons, being in Kurdistan during the uprising. Uh, participating in constitutional negotiations. None of that would have been possible um, without Najmaldin Karim's support and friendship. Um, he, uh, of course, uh, is, he, he created this program. He created the Washington Kurdish Institute uh, and, and I think funded them basically uh, significantly himself. Uh, and then when he uh, returned to, Kir to Kurdistan after the 2003 war, became governor of Kirkuk. Uh, he wanted Kirkuk not to be a Kurdish city, but a multi-ethnic city where all its communities were, were represented. Um, uh, and even if or someday part of Kurdistan, but really he was focused on making Kirkuk a success. Uh, and in 2017, he was a key figure in the 
referendum on independence, uh, always a, a, a source of common sense, but also somebody who really recognized the importance of that referendum uh, to establish Kurdistan as an independent state, um, which I believe uh, someday it will. And uh, when it happens, uh, the independent country of Kurdistan will owe a big debt to Najmuddin Karim. I, I have to say, uh, good men uh, choose good partners. And uh, his wife, Zozan, was a lifelong partner, a, a person you could see her influence, uh, uh, and uh, she, she would speak out, and, and they just had a terrific relationship. And then he has uh, four children, and again, I think it's a measure of his success as to how well his children, Shwan, Sirwan, Karwan, and Abin are doing. So just a great human being, but the most important thing from my point of view is that he was my friend and I miss him. Thank you, Ambassador Galbraith, for sharing your thoughts. And I would like um, next uh, to invite Dr. Ghazi Zibari to say a few words. Dr. Ghazi Zibari is a physician um, in the United States who has also known Dr. Kareem for a very long time. Dr. Zibari. It is a true honor and privilege for me to say a few words about the legacy of Dr. Najmuddin Kareem. Uh, our beloved governor of Kirkuk province in Kurdistan of Iraq, respected board members, invited speakers, Professor ha Hammond and Professor Tasker, and all colleagues. Dr. Naj was a first-rate neurosurgeon, and he had touched thousands of lives. He treated his patient like his own. His heart was bigger than this world. He was a big brother and a role model to many of us. Despite his busy clinical services, he always managed to find time to advocate for the Peshmerga and for the people of Kurdistan in Washington, D.C. He had committed his life to Kurdish struggle for freedom and equality and democracy. He was a great leader and a very polished pol politician. I do believe he was very instrumental in convincing the U.S. Congress and different U.S. administration over the last four decades to support people of Kurdistan. Dr. Natch was a true Peshmerga and a patriot who put the interest of the people of Kurdistan above everything else. He believed in tolerance, transparency, equality, and democracy. Baghdad and Tehran would have given him whatever he wanted if he would have joined Baghdad but as expected of him, he chose to defend the people of Kirkuk at all costs. Also, as uh, uh, Ambassador stated that, we must not forget uh, Dr. Nash did all of this at the expense of his family's sacrifices. As we say, behind every great leader, there is a great woman. Many thanks to Sister Suzanne and to the children for their unwavering support to him. Dr. Nash was very visionary, and this chair of Kurdish political study is one of those small examples of his vision. He would always think outside of the box, and he would push the envelope to its limit. Kurdistan and United States lost a giant, and his premature departure from this world is very unfortunate during these trying times. We are very thankful to the leadership of University of Florida, and particularly to Professor Haman and Professor Tasker and all board members to help us all celebrate Dr. Naj's legacy. May God bless him up in heaven. He is missed by all. May God bless America and may God bless people of Kurdistan and particularly people of Kirkuk. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Zibari. And I would also like to invite uh, Joe Reeder to share a few uh, comments and thoughts about Dr. Kareem. Joe. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. Um, and let me just echo uh, a little of what uh, Dr. Zabari uh, said earlier before we came on. I told Dr. Zabari, who's one of the great uh, transplant doctors in the country, that I hope I never need him. And I often told uh, Naj Kareem uh, we talk about uh, that won't take a rocket scientist or a, or a neurosurgeon. Well, um, 
Naj was a neurosurgeon and he uh, uh, he's now back uh, in his beloved Kurdistan thanks to President uh, Neshwan uh, Barzani who flew him uh, and his elegant, uh, gracious life partner, Zozan, and their four children, enormously talented. Uh, how you come here from Kurdistan and, uh, and uh, create four great Americans like that is a testament to this country and to that great family. He was hands down, and I'm speaking uh, not only for myself, I haven't begun to know him as long as the last two, Peter and uh, Ghazi, uh, but I have known him for 15 years, and I've crisscrossed uh, Kurdistan, beautiful countryside of Kurdistan, with him. I speak for Ban uh, Al Rockman, who's the official representative here in town, and Jay Garner, and and for me, uh, he hands down has been the number one, with no close second, advocate, passionate, eloquent, forceful, respected, and beloved uh, advocate uh, for for the Kurdish people in for Kurdistan and uh, um, he's back there because that was his wish to go back to his beloved Kurdistan. He was, um, um, as Dr. Zabari indicated, uh, um, very intent upon not just leading a Kurdish Kirkuk, but leading a Kirkuk and being, uh, being fair and equal and, uh, to all of the different ethnic groups in that uh, great city. And uh, as testament to uh, him uh, uh, walking the walk and talking the talk, he, his uh, positive rating in the polls um, uh, at one point, and I doubt seriously that ever changed, he was the most popular politician in all of, all of Iraq, just out, out there in, in the Kirkuk region taking, it, taking a poll. Um, he's a dear, dear friend. Um, the, uh, the obituary in the Washington Post uh, uh, played paid great tribute to him if you if you haven't read it and his life and his contributions and he was the doctor of choice uh, for um, the the president and has been for the president of Kurdistan going back uh, 30 years so uh, Kirsten thank you for giving me a couple minutes to speak on my behalf General Jay Garner's behalf and a band. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Reader, and also again, Dr. Zibari and Ambassador Galbraith. And I think just uh, the fact that you're here and you're taking the time to to talk about his legacy and his contributions um, is speaks volumes for the whole that uh, Dr. Karim is leaving um, here at UCF in the U.S. in Kurdistan and in the world. He truly was a visionary and the kind and generous person. He will be missed by many. What we can do, however, to honor uh, Dr. Kareem's legacy is to, to do work in the Kurdish Political Studies Program. And the program has established a fellowship to honor Dr. Kareem, which is now in its fifth year. The fellowship is awarded annually to an outstanding student interested in Kurdish studies. This year, to honor Dr. Kareem's legacy, the program is awarding the fellowship to two students. And it is my pleasure to congratulate this year's winners and recipients of the Dr. Kareem Fellowship. Um, I hope the students are here and can um, wave and join us in a little bit. The, the first student is going to be uh, Sophia Griemer. She will be the fellow for spring 2021. She's majoring in biomedical science with a minor in cultural anthropology. Sophia's project is titled Traditional Healing Beyond the Homeland, Yazidi Shamanic Healing Practices in the Diaspora. Sophia works with uh, among the Yazidis in Germany and her undergraduate um, honors thesis committee is chaired by Dr. Tyler Fischer. The second student is Mohammed Al Awad, who will be the follower in fall 2021. He's majoring, <coughs> excuse me, um, Sorry, uh, he's majoring in, in political science with a minor in philosophy, and he is currently a virtual intern at the U.S. consulate in Erbil, working on human rights related issues. His honor, honors undergraduate thesis is on regime resiliency in the Middle East and is chaired by Dr. Gunish Teskor. Um, congratulations to Sophia and Mohammed. Um, are you there? And you certainly have very exciting um, projects. If you're there, if you could. Say hello and introduce yourselves very briefly. 
Hi, um, I'm Sophia. Thank you so much for this honor. Sophia, it's a pleasure. Congratulations. And um, Mohammed, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Hammond. I'd like to uh, thank and dedicate this uh, opportunity to Dr. Tesker for everything that he has done to aid me in my uh, academic journey. And I'd like to thank the Kurdish Political Studies Program uh, for organizing this event and uh, having me here today. So thank you. Congratulations again and good luck with your exciting projects. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gunas uh, Teshko, who is the Jalal Talabani Endowed Chair of Kurdish Political Studies. And Dr. Teshko will open the panel and introduce today's speakers. Um, Dr. Teshko? Good afternoon, everybody. And I say, say good after evening because some of you are based in the other side of the Atlantic. Um, I just want to say something about Dr. Naj's legacy. Uh, I was with him um, during the referendum back in September 2017. Uh, and I have to say that I think what happened in October of 2017 maybe had a heavy burden on him. Um, and I mean, this kind of always reminds me like how difficult can be Kurdish politics. Uh, there are basically huge stakes involved and then sometimes it can be a life and death struggle. Uh, so this is basically, I mean, we always talk about we are political scientists, we study it. But I mean, when you basically observe people who engage in politics, especially in that part of the world, in Kurdistan, then you basically see that how dedicated they need to be if they want to continue that. Uh, and then this, I think this, is a, this has been also the experience of Dr. Nash. Uh, at the same time, I mean, we are hopeful that the fellowship and other activities we do will honor her, uh, his legacy in the long run. And I think that will be one of his, uh, again, like the legacies uh, in this country, uh, I would say. And then our two fellows, uh, one in spring, Sophia in spring 2021, and Mohammed in fall 2021, uh, they will do excellent work. And that will obviously be a part of the cultivation of Kurdish studies in this country. Uh, so <clears throat> I would like to uh, introduce our two very distinguished speakers. And I have to say that both Mesut Yan and Michael Lisenberg have been involved in Kurdish studies for a very long time before it became maybe more fashionable to do so. I mean, if you're in the Kurdish studies, I'm sure that you are familiar with their works, uh, which have been very influential. Uh, Mesut mostly does work in um, Kurdish question in Turkey, while Michael, if I say, has a, uh, I mean, I was said he always do, do, did work in other places, but primarily in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, I mean, they basically have been writing about the Kurdish issues since the 1990s uh, for a very long time. Uh, again, I mean, in a sense, before the issue became maybe more well known, it became basically maybe more fashionable. They have been basically really doing great and leading studies uh, on Kurdish question. So I will basically keep my introduction short because I think uh, we are all look forward to listening to their speeches. So they are going to talk for maybe 25, 25 minutes. And then after they finish with their talks, uh, I will open the uh, Q&A section. And if you don't mind, please use the chat box so I can basically read the questions you put there. I mean, you can even put the questions while they are speaking, but we are going to basically, uh, I am going to direct the questions to them after they are uh, done with their talks. Uh, let me start basically, I mean, Mesut is going to be our first speaker. Uh, he's currently in Shale University. He's a professor of sociology. As I just mentioned, I think he has been one of the pioneers, uh, pioneering scholars uh, regarding the Kurdish question in Turkey. I mean, I, I mean, I came to Kurdish question a bit late and I started the, my career starting, studying other topics, but I can tell you that, I mean, his studies were also influential on how I think about the Kurdish question in Turkey uh, for a long time. Um, so he's going to talk about most of the Kurdish question in Turkey and the title of his talk is Ethnopolitics and Geopolitics, the Turkish state and the Kurdish question since 2015. Uh, Professor Yan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, flattering words, uh, Yunesh. And thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, uh, it's really uh, a privilege for me to be able to speak in a meeting which is dedicated to the memory of uh, Najmet Tinkerim. I haven't known, uh, I didn't know him in person, uh, but of course I followed uh, what he did when he was the governor of uh, Kirkuk. Uh, okay, uh, as uh, Murat uh, uh, said during his introduction, uh, I've been working on the Kurdish question for a long time, and I basically uh, focused on the ways in which the Turkish state has perceived and dealt with the Kurdish question in Turkey. And today, uh, I will do uh, something similar to what I've done 
up to now, but as you can imagine, as the very title of my speech uh, indicates, I'll mainly focus on what has been taking place since 2015, okay? Well, as the title itself uh, entails, I basically suggest that there has been a change in the way in which the Turkish state has perceived and engaged in the Kurdish question since 2015. And I argue that this change may be defined as a kind of transition from ethnopolitics to geopolitics. And my overall argument is that the, while the Turkish state perceives the Kurdish question through the lens of ethnopolitics since the foundation of the Republic, it now perceives the same question through the lenses of geopolitics. And accordingly, while the Turkish state engage in the Kurdish question by means of the instruments of ethnopolitics until very recently, it now employs the instruments of uh, geopolitics in dealing with the Kurdish question. However, uh, I assume that there is no need huh, to remind that my argument does not go so far as to suggest that the geopolitical perspective uh, and geopolitical instruments have kind of overruled the ethnopolitical perspective and the ethnopolitical instruments. This is not what I'm saying, of course. What I'm saying is that Turkish state is now trying to contain the uh, Kurdish question in Turkey by means of geopolitics without, of course, renouncing ethnopolitics. Now, before I try to explain what uh, the geopolitical perspective is about, let me say a few things about the ethnopolitical perspective, okay, which uh, was used and which, in a sense, is still being used by the Turkish state. Okay? Well, here I use the term ethnopolitics to refer to the perspectives and the instruments almost all modern states have used in the process of nation building, which of course always involves uh, a nation, nation destroying dimension. Uh, that's to say, I use the term ethnopolitics to refer to, I, I use it as a kind of, let's say, umbrella term, okay, to refer to all major perspectives employed in nation building business, such as what, such as accommodation, such as assimilation, such as exclusion. And again, I use the term to refer to all the major instruments that have been employed in the process of nation building, such as, I don't know, making, for instance, population homogeneous, annihilation, recognition, this and that, okay? Now, I think even a quick look at what has taken place in Turkey indicates that all these perspectives and instruments that I've just listed have been used okay, in nation building process in Turkey in general and in the case of Kurds and Kurdish question in particular, which to say that the Turkish state has used all the main perspectives and instruments of ethnopolitics when it's engaged in the Kurdish question, but of course in different extent or in, in different degrees. I think roughly speaking, I may suggest that the Turkish state has engaged in the Kurdish question mainly by means of assimilation from time to time, by means of exclusion, and occasionally with, let's say, accommodation until 2015. But since 2015, there have been signs, I should say, indicating that this uh, pattern of, let's say, engaging with the Kurdish question is kind of changing. There are now, I suggest, signals uh, which kind of indicate that the Turkish state is now using different lenses and different instruments to contain or govern Kurdish question. Since 2015, the Turkish state has been engaging in Kurdish question with a geological, geopolitical perspective and with geopolitical instruments. Well, this is my argument, and now I'll try to substantiate okay, my argument. 
Okay, before I try to explain what I understand by the term ethno, sorry, by the term geopolitics, let me first underline one basic fact. The fact that uh, the term geopolitics, or I'm not using the term geopolitics as a kind of synonym, okay, for a kind of, let's say, regional perspective or regional politics. Geopolitics, according to my knowledge, is something broader or more than a uh, regional perspective. And in fact, uh, it would be a bit illogical, I should say, okay, to use the term geopolitics okay, as a kind of synonym for regional perspective, simply because uh, regional perspective has always been there since the very foundation of the Republic or since the very emergence, I should say, of the Kurdish question simply because the Kurdish question itself okay, emerged as a regional question. Because we know uh, immediately after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1918, the once uh, Ottoman citizens Kurds uh, sort of try to maintain okay, the social, economic, political ties that they had been using, okay? uh, that means they uh, remained in touch okay, with each other. And besides, Kurds of each of these three countries challenged the status quo that they were sort of thrown into. So, yeah, so in this sense, the Kurdish question has from the very beginning okay, been a kind of regional question. So in this sense, I'm not simply saying that, okay, the Tur Turkish state is now looking at the Kurdish question from a regional perspective because such a perspective was always there. But on the other hand, let me tell you this. While it's true that the uh, Kurdish question emerged as a regional question per se, uh, there has been some qualitative change okay, in the regional character okay, of the Kurdish uh, question. I mean, we know uh, for instance, the uh, Kurdish question uh, for a long, for a long time uh, happened to be a kind of uh, site, let's say, of cooperation for the uh, three states, okay, uh, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria, up until, and Iran, of course, up until 1970s, whereas things dramatically changed after 1970s, many of these states started to use sort of um, uh, Kurdish card okay, against each other. For instance, we know in 1925, um, the French mandated Syria allowed the Turkish troops to surrender the Kurdish uh, uh, rebels in 1925. And we know uh, Iran and Turkey agreed to sort of adjust their border in order to be able to cope with the Kurdish uh, resistors of the time, this and that. So what I'm trying to say is this, okay, for a long time, the regional uh, characteristic of the Kurdish question uh, sort of mandated okay, the uh, states or the countries hosting Kurds to be in a kind of cooperation. And this changed radically in 1970s. We know first Iran and Iraq used the Kurdish card against each other, then Syria did the same in the case of Turkey, this and that. So although uh, Kurdish question has been a regional question since the beginning, as I said, there has been some qualitative change in the very nature okay, of, or in the course of the uh, 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 regional dimension of the question. And again, in 2003, you know, with the uh, United States intervention, uh, this regional question turned to have uh, started to have a kind of let's say supra regional layer as well and again together with 2003 a remarkable change took place in the status quo of curse that to say while Kurdish question was a regional question okay from its birth to 19 almost 90s no uh, sort of uh, substantial change okay, took place in their status quo. Whereas together with 2003, 
some remarkable change took place in that field. And again, in 2011, we know that uh, with the intervention of uh, the many other actors, the Kurdish question in the region turned to become not only a regional one, but let's say local, national, regional, global, whatever, this and that. Okay, so, okay. Uh, I think um, it took uh, a bit long for you to explain uh, what I mean, okay, uh, when I say uh, geopolitical, uh, the fact that Kurdish question is a geopolitical question does not mean that it's a kind of uh, regional question. It's actually broader, okay, more than this. And this, this more, or what is more to uh, the geopolitical perspective, I think, can be explained by means of uh, five, I should say, novel dimensions or components, I should say, okay? Let's say there are now five novel components, which to my knowledge, okay, uh, has kind of produced a sort of uh, remarkable change, okay, in the course of the Kurdish question. And this is why I prefer to use the term ethnopolitics to geopolitics. Okay, now let me try to speak about them. Okay, the biggest component is that uh, uh, the, I mean, the Turkish state has been perceiving a kind of revisionist regional politics since 2011. Okay, so the, the, big, the, big, the biggest component is the revisionist regional politics Turkey uh, has been after since 2011. Well, here the case uh, is obvious. Okay? Turkey has for some time been seeking to have some more influence or power in the region. And I think it must be thanks to the change in the way in which the United States is evolved into the Middle East and thanks to the vacuum, political vacuum created by the Arab Spring that Turkey is somehow uh, appealed, I should say, by the idea that she should sort of, she should have abandoned the position that she had pursued since 1952. And I think it's due to this revisionist logic that Turkey did the following in the past few years. Let me check from my notes. Okay, first, as you know, Turkey tried to assume the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood from Tunisia to Syria during Arab Spring. And she, Turkey got involved into wars in Syria and Libya. Uh, she also developed some good relations with her conventional rivals, uh, such as Russia and Iran, and such a good relations with a new actor, Qatar. And Turkey also confronted the old friends in the region, such as Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and even the US. Now, bear in mind that none of these steps okay, taken by Turkey were in line okay, with what Turkey had done in the past. Okay? Then what I'm saying is this, Turkey has for some time been pursuing a new position in the region and it looks at the Kurdish question in Turkey, in Iraq, in Syria, in accordance with what is suggested or mandated, I should say, by this new position. In this framework, uh, Kurds and Kurdish question in different places and different times are perceived a leverage as well as an obstacle okay, for this revisionist uh, politics. That's to say, I'm not simply saying that Turkey is trying to sort of suppress Kurds everywhere. Rather, Kurds or Kurdish question are used both as a kind of leverage and it's sometimes perceived as a kind of obstacle okay, in front of this revisionist politics. But I think what is important uh, in the case of this revisionist perspective or in this new regional politics is that Turkey's perception of its own Kurdish question is now conditioned by her perception of the course of the Kurdish question in Iraq and Syria, which in turn is conditioned okay, by uh, Turkey's uh, uh, revisionist regional perspective. Okay? So 
This is the first component. The second component is that Turkey is now substituting Iraq's and Syria's central governments in some of these spaces populated by the Kurds in these two countries. In other words, the role of maintaining order and containing Kurds uh, in these, uh, in some spaces, not throughout all these, uh, throughout these two countries, but in some spaces in these two countries is now performed by the Turkish state itself. So the substitution of Iraqi and Syrian central authorities okay, by the Turkish state on the territories of Iraq and Syria is the second component of uh, the perspective that I'm talking about. The third component is kind of similar. It, it, it has to do with the fact that Turkish state is substituting not only Iraqs and Syria's armies or terms of intelligence, but Turkey is actually substituting all the main functions okay, performed by these two states. Not only the Turkish army and intelligence, but almost all main branches of Turkish bureaucracy execute uh, state power in some parts of Iraq and especially in Syria. You all should know that Turkish police, Turkish governors, Turkish schools, Turkish Lira, Turkish Telecom, they all are present okay, in here and there in Syria and in some parts of uh, uh, Iraq. In other words, it's as if the Turkish bureaucracy has kind of floated into, uh, extended into Syria and Iraq. So that means uh, Iraq and Syria, some parts of Iraq and Syria, which are populated by Kurds now are in the sort of scope of both repressive and ideological uh, state apparatus of, of Turkey. That's to say some non-Turkish citizens, okay, now are sort of uh, within the scope okay, of the, as I say, uh, ideological and repressive state apparatus of uh, Turkey. Okay? Now the fourth, comp fourth component, has to do with utilizing, I should say, non-Turkish people, citizens, and non-Turkish territories okay, to contain or govern, I should say, uh, the Kurdish question uh, here and there. For some time, we know that Turkish state has been utilizing Arab, Turkomans, and Kurds of Syria and Iraq, and Iraqi and Syria, Syrian territories to contain the Kurds of Turkey, the Kurds of Iraq, and the Kurds of Syria. You know, uh, those uh, Syrian uh, Arabs who were displaced okay, during the uh, Syrian war are now resettled by the, Kurdish, uh, by the Turkish uh, uh, state uh, with the aim of being kind of more able to contain, as I said, Kurds in, in, in Turkey and Kurds in in Syria. Again, you all must have heard that Turkey is aiming to launch a new uh, border gate on the Iraqi border so as to make the current international motorway not to pass through uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. And the last component has to do with the way in which the Turkish state is preoccupied with the Kurds and the Kurdish question within Turkish borders. Here, the case is that the conventional, I should say, ethnopolitical question, whether Kurdish question in Turkey needs to be handled by means of assimilation, by means of recognition, by means of exclusion, this and that, does not seem to be puzzling the Turkish state anymore. It's as if the, this question is no more okay, on the agenda of the Turkish state. Instead, the Turkish state seems kind of, how should I say, determined to tackle with the Kurds and the Kurdish question by means of, as you again all should know, perpetual kind of emergency rule. Okay? Having uh, often uh, announced that the Kurdish question is now resolved, Turkish state is now looking at the Kurdish question in Turkey as I said, not on the basis of uh, this ethnopolitical, giant ethnopolitical question, okay, but 
that say not uh, from the perspective of nation building, but from uh, the perspective of uh, uh, to be able to contain Kurdish question not only in Turkey, but in Iraq and in Syria too, and from the perspective of trying to be kind of more influential in uh, the region. Well, this is what I mean when I argue that there has been a change, okay, in the way in which the Turkish state uh, perceives the Kurdish question and in the way in which the Turkish state is kind of preoccupied okay, with the uh, Kurdish question. Now, uh, I, I want to finish, I think I have three or four minutes. Let me finish uh, by a couple of words about the, about the sustainability of uh, geopolitics in Kurdish question. Okay, let me try to say a couple of words as to whether this can be kind of maintained or not, this perspective can be maintained. Well, there, let me say this. Um, if you look at the external and internal or domestic factors, okay, you may easily say that, well, uh, there are factors, okay, there are external and domestic factors, okay, which sort of would make difficult to sustain this geopolitical perspective, yet there are also some others, okay, which can easily make, okay, possible to sort of maintain the same perspective, okay. Let me try to sort of provide an analysis of the external factors on the basis of this ambivalence, let me say. Okay? Well, first of all, we know that the, the, the current raccoon in the regional politics, which uh, has allowed Turkey to be more daring, okay? kind of more, I don't know, uh, able, I should say, in the region, this, this regional raccoon is still there. And it seems that it's gonna stay there, okay, for some future. And this makes me this makes me think that geopolitics in Kurdish question uh, is sustainable because uh, this this vacuum, okay, is gonna be there for a kind of foreseeable future. Okay? So until a kind of new regional status quo, okay, is established, I think it's likely that this geopolitics may be sort of maintain. Also, uh, the fact that Turkish military or Turkey has a kind of military capacity which proved to be functional and that uh, Turkey has some strategic allies such as Qatar and some ad hoc, I don't know, allies let's say such as Russia and Iran, I think should be kind of encouraging Turkey uh, should be encouraging for Turkey to, again, uphold to her status or to maintain this geopolitical perspective. Yet, conversely, there are some, of course, external factors which work otherwise, okay? For instance, we know that the relations with the US will likely lead to become even more friend unfriendly once Biden replaces Trump. We know that the Muslim Brotherhood in the region is no more powerful. We know that relations uh, with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, France, and others are kind of almost hostile relations, that the US has a kind of protective role over Iraqi and Syrian Kurds. And I think that even Russia and Iran would not be that much happy to see a Turkey which is kind of more influential in the region. All these external factors, I think, make me think that, okay, uh, yeah, it's a bit, it could be a bit difficult to sort of reproduce, to maintain the current uh, geopolitical perspective. To these, of course, I may add the, the, the uh, question of finance. As you can imagine, financing this geopolitical perspective should be a difficult task, to be honest, okay? And to be honest, I don't know how it's actually financed, uh, but I doubt that it can be sort of uh, financed in the uh, long run. So uh, this question of finance, okay, is another factor which uh, makes me think that, okay, it's a bit difficult to maintain the current uh, geopolitical perspective. Okay, if, when you look at the domestic factors, you see 
a similar picture. Again, there are factors which sort of support and which sort of challenge the current position. Now we know that, I mean, uh, there has been a kind of radical change in the mindsets and the agents of the Turkish establishment since at least 2013. Now we have a kind of more rationalist, more, I don't know, Islamist, more anti-government, whatever, uh, anti, anti Western government. Okay. Uh, and besides this government has a kind of popular support. So that means this job in, in domestically, this geopolitical perspective seems to be kind of uh, supported by the uh, different segments of Turkish bureaucracy and by a uh, huge portion of Turkish people. Yet, on the other hand, we also know that, I mean, uh, it's quite likely that Erdogan and his authoritarian regime might be sort of replaced soon in, a, in the coming elections, okay? So that means if a new, new less anti-Western, more democratic, less Islamist, less nationalist government comes to power, and it's quite likely, I should say, if such a government, such a government comes to power, then it's likely that this kind of a government would follow a different path, but I should say not an entirely different path. Okay, let me finish by this. I think it's likely that, yeah, if a power change takes place in Turkey, it's likely that, okay, this current perspective would be kind of revised, but I should say not entirely. And there, this is what I think. As long as uh, the regional raccoon that I mentioned a couple of times remains there, and as long as the ties uh, between Kurds of Iraq, Syria, and, and uh, Turkey uh, remain as strong as they are now, okay, Turkish establishment, no matter okay, what government okay, rules Turkey, will be kind of uh, how should I say, uh, alert and would be tempted, I suppose, to follow the a kind of version of the geopolitical perspective that I mentioned. That say, no matter what happens, I think Turkey in the uh, foreseeable future will continue to think the Kurdish question in Turkey, not on the basis of the Kurdish question in Turkey itself, but on the basis of what takes place in Syria and Iraq and on the basis of what takes place in the region. And I think I can finish here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. And I should say that this actually makes a great article, subject itself. And I mean, hopefully you will be publishing this soon uh, so we can actually <laughs> read it in print. I've too. been working on it, Kinesh. Yeah, hopefully I'll finish by summer. I mean, you actually kind of systemize what I was thinking about the Kurdish question in Turkey nowadays. So, I mean, it really kind of speaks to like how I kind of make sense of the situation now. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Professor Lizenberg, who is based in Amsterdam. Uh, he's actually a philosopher. Uh, maybe you find that interesting, but he's actually working on the Kurds for a long time. And I have to say that, I mean, I actually learn a lot from his studies, specifically on minorities in Kurdish lands. So he basically has some pieces which basically deal with the religious diversity in uh, Kurdish lands. But today he's going to talk more about the Iraqi Kurdistan. And when we were chatting before the talk, he just mentioned that the economy, the political economy is really understudied subject in Kurdish studies, especially in the Iraqi Kurdistan, I, I, I completely agree. So he's actually going to talk about the political economy of uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. And then the name of his talk is Beyond Oil, the political economy of the Kurdistan region of Iraq. So Professor Lisenberg. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks especially to Ganesh and Haidar and to Sarah for their invitation with which I feel quite flattered. Um, thanks also to uh, Kak Masood for his presentation. My talk will be linking a bit to that. Uh, I'm trying to send you the file of my presentation, but I can't find it back on my computer straight away. Otherwise, I'll just uh, share it through screen sharing. And if you'd like to get a copy of my PowerPoint, you can always mail me about it. It's always a pleasure to be among some old friends and hopefully to make some new ones. It's, it's wonderful to see some people I've known for a long time and to meet them again here. Uh, but let me get back to matters of content and share you the screen. Yeah, that should work. Okay, um, because I will be uh, trying to complement, trying to complement the usual analysis of situation in uh, the Kurdistan region of Iraq by focusing on the political economy. And it's uh, an interesting topic that I think deserves far more attention than it usually gets. 
So um, I hope, I cannot hope to give you fully um, complete and convincing analysis, I'm afraid, but I hope to at least get you interested in a couple of the questions that I think deserve asking and deserve uh, an answer by somebody more qualified than I am, because as Ganesh quite correctly observes, I'm just a poor philosopher, so I'm transgressing my field. Uh, I'd like also to pay homage to somebody else who passed away too early, and that's Faleh Abdul Jabbar, um, because he's an Iraqi opposition intellectual who spends all of his life not only to making Iraq a better place, but also to do that in intellectual terms. And he has always been quite relentless in emphasizing the importance of the political economy of the country. Uh, he passed away, uh, I think, just a bit over two years ago now, quite unexpectedly, but sure to be for his death, had the honor of meeting again in his office in Beirut, where he had just finished a new translation into Arabic of Capital by Karl Marx, which he was quite justifiably proud of. Um, the reason why I pay homage to him is that he actually financed the, the most recent effort I made into uh, the political economy of Iraqi Kurdistan and also the Kurdistan part in Turkey. Uh, in the framework of this research project on governing diversity and the Kurds, um, I had been doing some work on this topic before, but uh, thanks to his support, I could do another episode of fieldwork in August 2015, which of course was quite a uh, dramatic episode, but of course, as usual with this region, no sooner had I finished my research than a new dramatic episode occurred, namely the referendum and its aftermath. So in a way, it's, it's a stock taking of a moment that may have been passed already. Uh, the, the problem for Iraqi Kurdistan is that even more than the, the southeastern part of Turkey, it's, it's actually an economist nightmare. So that's perhaps the reason why a philosopher like me has a free play there. Um, there's very, very little statistics around. And that's, of course, what uh, bona fide economists would like to, to start working on. So in the absence of that, I've always done, let's say, more qualitative research. Um, and I should make a disclaimer, despite the picture to the left, I am not, nor have I ever been, either a Marxist or an economist in the strict sense of the word. So again, uh, I invite these comments only as an invitation for further consideration and further research into these questions, hoping that people more qualified than I can continue this work. The reason why I focus on political economy is that actually um, the existing political analyses of the the region are at times a bit, um, shall we say, one-sided or uh, unidimensionally focusing on the politics of the region, which is of course perfectly legitimate. But I think some of the questions that can and I think should be raised are forgotten with a as a result of this uh, bias towards the political and towards national and regional politics. So if you ask questions why, for example, the, the Arab Spring revolts, so the protests of 2010, 2011, which also occurred in the Kurdistan region in Iraq, why did they fail? Uh, why in 2014, when all of a sudden the regional government stopped paying salaries almost completely from one day to another, why there was no serious popular protest against that, at least in part of the, the region? And why also, for example, the aftermath of the referendum in 2017, why it did not lead to a major military confrontation between the Kurdish Peshmerga and the Iraqi government troops and its uh, militias. Um, if you look at the economy, you may get a slightly different answer to such questions than um, when you only look at them at the political or strategic level. So what I hope to argue for is that it's important to look at the specifics of the Kurdish trajectory in Iraq, as it would be in Turkey, not only on the level of politics or on a purely ethnic level, there may also be reason to look at uh, the specifics of these regions in economic terms. And that's actually what my research focused on. So it would complement, not so much reject or refute analyses like those of, let's say, Denise Natalie, who's focusing on the Kurdistan region as a quasi-state and who focuses on the oil economy, which again, I'm not denying the usefulness of that. I'm hoping to give a compliment to these analyses. 
Likewise, uh, Gerhard Sensfield and his analyses of the Kurdistan region as an emerging democracy largely focuses on party politics and developments there. And again, it's a legitimate analysis, but I hope to look a bit below that level. Because what you usually hear is that there's a major constraint on Iraqi Kurdish independence because it's a dependent economy in that it is dependent on the oil infrastructure of Iraq as a whole and on the world market for oil, which is of course perfectly true. But this leads some analysts to argue that Iraqi Kurdistan qualifies as something like a rentier state in the classical political economy sense of the word. But the problem with such analyses is that this concept of a rentier state is a bit too coarse grained for my tastes, because it lumps together completely different states, even within um, the Middle East, like Iraq under and after Saddam, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Um, again, the political differences are as important as the, the, the commonalities, even at the level of political economy. And I think one reason for that is that the role of ideology and political organization is quite crucial here. So what does unite, so to speak, Iraq and Egypt and Syria, and in a way also the Kurdistan region of Iraq, it's like a during, an enduring Leninist uh, heritage, both in ideology and in political organization. If I had time, I would elaborate on that point, but unfortunately I don't. Another problem of these analyses <clears throat> is that they are generally at the level of states or at the best of entire regions <clears throat> and that they only focus on oil extraction to the exclusion of any other branch of the economy. Now every time I was in Iraqi Kurdistan I was always struck by the lack of attention to the other economic activities that were going on, so to speak, below, be underneath our very eyes if only we would look at it, um, you would see, let's say, if you were staying in a hotel or in the guest house of a university, right underneath it, there would be a barber or a grocer that nobody ever bothered to talk to. And as soon as you actually start interviewing these people, you would hear things that not only are completely at odds with the official economic and political narratives, you would also hear the most bizarre economic facts. For example, the fact that there were five or six grocers in the same street, all of them selling the same imported goods from Turkey and Iran in particular. Apparently none of them making a living from what they sold, but still all of them did make a living. So where exactly did they get their funding from? These are quite simple and quite basic questions that to the best of my knowledge have basically never been raised by people studying the region. So there's actually lots of interesting and important questions to be answered there. So a focus on trade, on crafts, on agriculture, on services, would repay every effort you put into it because you will, and I promise you that, you will find completely astonishing things there. I can give you a couple of examples only in the following. So to mention in broad outline, and this is just the basics of things I've been exploring in papers in more detail, um, there is of course an important economic dimension to the continuing confrontation of Iraq as a state and the Kurdish movement within Iraq nowadays institutionalized in the Kurdistan region. To mention just a few of them, and again, each of them would deserve a full paper on their own. Um, when Iraq became a republic in 1958, there was an annunciation of um, land reforms. Um, in fact, Fala Abdul Jabbar apparently has made a study of that, but it hasn't been published during his lifetime. I hope it will be at some point. Um, the land reform not only tried to counter the influence of the large landowners, it also had an economic and a, um, an ethnic dimension, which has not yet been fully explored. Because of course, the Kurdish landowners perceive this as an attack, not only on them as landowners, but also as Kurds. Likewise, these land reforms coincide with a period of very intensive urbanization in Iraq, with the result that by the mid 1970s, in all likelihood, independently from anything political, um, Iraq had become a majority urban society, including the Kurdistan region. This was, of course, exacerbated by the, the collectivization of agriculture in the 70s, um, which, of course, in the case of the Kurds, involved the deportation of lots of Kurds from, in particular, the region. 
Lots of camps. I'm getting some interference from somebody who doesn't switch up the microphone. Apparently. I hope it doesn't bother you. Okay, um, sorry for the interruption. <clears throat> uh, again, the famous familiar story of the Invitag or opening policy of the 1980s, which in Iraq was basically the same pattern as in Egypt and Syria. But what's less known is that in 1989, there was an acute economic crisis in Iraq in the aftermath of the first Gulf War between Iraq and Iran. Demobiliza demobilization of basically some like over half a million soldiers, an acute currency shortage, uh, increasing debts, which by then had reached almost $100 billion in worth, and the presence of large numbers of migrant workers. I actually was in Iraq during this period, and I was astonished to see the treatment of these migrant workers. It was, it, it, it's, a, it's a horrible story that's only one side show in the tragedy that was Iraq at this time. Also less known than it should be is the fact that underneath the sanctions regime imposed by United Nations in the early 90s, there was something like a shock therapy administered to the Iraqi economy by Saddam Hussein's government. So very quick privatizations of large parts of the economy leading to price hikes and they would have led to bigger social protests if the Iraqi government had, been able, had not been able to deflect the blame for these measures to these uh, sanctions. At the same time, of course, um, there was an internal blo blockade impo imposed against the Kurdistan region, which led to an increase in smuggling of oil products and foodstuffs and so on. So again, this is not a topic I can elaborate in detail, but what you did see already at that time was, it was primarily humanitarian agencies that tried to revive and rehabilitate the regional agriculture, which had been destroyed largely by Iraqi government policies. But for a large number of structural reasons, it was basically impossible to get people to move back to the villages and to get the agriculture of the region going again. And this has not changed since. So it is impossible to revive anything like agricultural economy in the region on a larger scale, which I think is an important structural feature of the Iraqi Kurdistan economy even nowadays. So here we come to the main topic. And again, I have to be very brief, but it's a chapter in the book edited by Falah and by Renat Mansour, published last year, I think. Um, I emphasize the importance of a regional political economy that's structurally distinct from that of Iraq as a whole, as there is a regional political economy in southeastern Turkey, which is distinct from the Turkish political economy. Of course, in Iraq, this difference this different trajectory starts in 1991 when a de facto autonomy emerged. In that respect, you could argue that 2003 does not mark as radical a rupture for the region as it does for Iraq as a whole. One stock phrase that any political economist worth his salt would emphasize that as a result of the American intervention, Iraq as a whole and the Kurdistan region too was incorporated into the capitalist world market. But in fact, that is only the case in a very restricted manner. Because as anybody who, will, who has been to Iraqi Kurdistan can testify, there is still a completely cash-based economy. Uh, you cannot use a credit card in, except in a few of the, the, the poshest hotels and restaurants. Even things as basic as transferring money, money from, let's say, Europe or America to Iraq take some uh, quite um, interesting informal channels quite often. And there's nothing like uh, an insurance network that can cover economic risks <clears throat> for people doing anything like venture capitalism. So its incorporation into the world market from 2003, if not before, is only very partial and again, quite understudied. The intriguing parallel with Turkey, however, is I think that both in Iraq and in Turkey, the Kurdish inhabited regions have gained a measure of autonomy as a result of somewhat less uh, studied processes. In Turkey, that process is not the dramatic capture of Öcalan in 1999 or the rise to power of the AK Party. It was the regional elections held in 1999, in which for the first time ever, pro-Kurdish parties, uh, at that time the, the then incarnation of the HDP, um, they gained a majority in a large number of communities 
and became able to start implementing their own ideas of economy, their own policies and so on. And it's led to an enormous change in the region that again, I think deserves more attention than it has received thus far. Now importantly in Southeastern Turkey, it was the HDP which tried to counter the effects of um, Erdogan's neoliberal policies. This policy in Turkey was driven primarily by a construction boom, partly also through this uh, state uh, construction agency. And that's an interesting but complex story that I cannot go into here. Uh, importantly also, of course, Turkey privatized its debt with the, the IMF and the World Bank. So nowadays the economy looks much healthier, but partly it's because debt has been transferred from the state to the IMF to, let's say, sub-state agencies. One hugely important development here has also been the emergence of gated communities, which in a city like Diyarbakir has, in a way, torn apart the traditional urban fabric in a very dramatic manner. And something similar you can probably also observe in Iraqi Kurdistan. Now the big question from a political economy perspective is, does this new neoliberal policy, which you can observe in different manners, both in Iraq and in Turkey, has it led to the formation of a new bourgeoisie? And in the case of Iraqi Kurdistan, that's only the case in a very restricted sense. Instead of a, um, let's say an autonomous and economically active bourgeoisie, you can rather say that a new level of clients has emerged, which is directly dependent on the region's oil income. So if you look beyond the oil extraction industry, you can see that a large number of new millionaires has emerged in the region. I think in both Erbil and Sulemania region, there's basically something in the order of a thousand new millionaires who are not business entrepreneurs. It's just simply they got some of the handouts from these oil revenues reaching the region. So in that sense, you could argue they're clients of the patronage system that has been in place there for a while, rather than independent local actors or a revolutionary um, group as argued for by Marx in his original writings. Likewise, in Turkey, this could have been the case to the extent that these newly um, affluent groups, uh, which in Southeastern Turkish, uh, Turkey have been called the white Kurds in analogy with the so-called Beyaz Türkler in the west of the country. Um, likewise, the prosperity of these groups is very much dependent on state policies rather than on their own economic activities, even though in Turkey, of course, there's rather more economic production than in Iraqi Kurdistan. Linked to that is an interesting question, to what extent both the Kurdish inhabited part in southeastern Turkey and the Kurdish dominated area in northern Iraq, to what extent there's something like an urban proletariat nowadays. And generally you could argue that southeastern Turkey has much more of a, an urban proletariat with a revolutionary potential than has Iraqi Kurdistan, partly because they have been co-opted by the patronage system and partly because they have been uh, called bourgeoisified. That is, they have been given handouts, they have been given higher education, they have been given pensions by the, the government or by local parties. So they're much more incorporated into the system. But there still is a substantial number of people who are still urban poor. And again, these are completely overlooked in economic and political studies of the region. And I think it's important that we do look more at this group. Is it a proletariat or is it what has been called an, a precariat? Well, given the capriciousness of regional politics and its economic consequences, perhaps the term precariat may be more applicable here. So the key concept here, and I think I should be coming to a close now. Um, the key concept here is undoubtedly that of patronage. And this has not quite been studied in a satisfactory manner. And here the philosopher in me uh, waxes again. Usually patronage is defined as a, by definition, informal and uh, not quite legitimate system. So it cannot be quite institutionalized. Well, the interesting thing is that in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, what patronage we find seems to be very thoroughly institutionalized. And it seems to be a key structural factor of the local political economy. Because as said, these newly affluent classes more than anything like a bourgeoisie in the classical sense of the word, 
is dependent on state handouts instead of being an independent autonomous actor with a revolutionary potential of its own. Likewise, foreign investors have in part been co-opted and in part been uh, actually discouraged from investing in the region because of course they have been generally forced to engage in something like a cooperative joint venture with local actors which more sounds like giving protection money than actually sharing uh, investments and sharing revenues. Likewise, a third component that everybody knows about, which I think fits into this general wider picture, is the fact that basically nobody really knows exactly how much money has come into the region in terms of both customs, levies, and oil revenues. So the lack of transparency is quite, quite substantial. And this allows for a climate in which patronage is the dominant form of, let's say, political dependency. A component part of that is, of course, also the so-called informal economy. There's, there still is lots of smuggling economy going on. So nowadays, for example, if you go to Diyarbakir, you can get uh, cheaper cigarettes and cheaper smartphones, which are actually imported from different parts of the world to the Kurdistan region of Iraq and then smuggled from Iraq to Turkey again. Likewise, to get back to the regional uh, government, um, Ganesh and Mesut have also mentioned this, something like 60% of the workforce in the Kurdistan region is directly dependent on state funding because they're in state employment, which has of course made the government extremely vulnerable to fluctuations in oil prices and oil production. So basically KRG policies have been predicated on the assumption that oil production would continue to increase and oil prices would remain stable or would increase also. Well, of course, over the past years, neither has proven the case. So you can see that there's an acute cash shortage in the regional government, quite apart even from any confrontation with the Iraqi government, with the result that nowadays the regional government in Iraq has an external debt of something in the order of $30 billion, which is quite a, a huge sum in comparison with the GDP to the extent that we know the latter. Of course, the problems are exacerbated by the fact that whatever oil is produced in the region is and is sold by local actors, it can be and has been contested legally. So it's difficult to sell Iraqi Kurdish oil on the international oil markets. Instead, you have seen over the past year that lots of Iraqi oil products have been produced and sold on the black market regionally. A final dimension, and I'm going to stop there with my analysis, is that higher education has been part of this complex because large numbers of people have been receiving a university education and basically have been assuming they were entitled not only to a, a university degree, but also to a paid job afterwards. And of course, both possibilities have been restricted in the face of the economic crisis that emerged in 2014. A final point, which I think is important for a closer look at the prospects of the region, is the fact there's nothing like a military service for all male youths in the region. And I think that explains part of what happened in the aftermath of the 2017 referendum. So let me conclude with a couple of open questions, and then I hope we can discuss a couple of these points. Um, if you want to ask the, the question of the, the independence or even self-sufficiency or autonomy of the Kurdistan region, uh, I think we should distinguish the moral question, which I think, uh, personally, I think the Kurds have as, as much right as anyone to assert their self-determination. Uh, it should be distinguished from the political dimensions of this question, the military ones, and the one I'm concerned with here, the economic dimensions. And economically, of course, Iraqi Kurdistan is very, very far from independence or even self-sufficient. Whatever official sources may say about the growth in agricultural production, the vast majority of foodstuffs in the region is imported nowadays. Even things that could easily be grown locally, it turns out it's not only easier to import, but also it's actually cheaper to import it. So there's lots of structural conditions militating against bigger economic independence. So if you want to go to a supermarket or to a grocery shop, chances are almost everything you find there is going to be imported from Turkey and Iran, but even from places as far away as Brazil. 
So if you want to buy a, a frozen chicken or turkey in a local supermarket, chances are it's actually not even from Turkey or Iran, but actually imported from across the Atlantic Ocean. Another dimension, and again, this is something I don't know of any serious analysis of, Underneath all the political conflicts, there's economic conflicts, many of which involve land property and land division. And this is a huge topic that we simply do not have even the beginnings of an understanding of. But it is a very, very important dimension, not only of the most recent IS war, but also of, let's say, political and ethnic relations over a longer period of time. So again, this, this would repay much more detailed uh, attention. Another open question and an important one is the fact, of course, that much of the labor force in the Kurdistan region of Iraq is not local. So especially the menial jobs in the services, let's say the restaurants or the hotels, anyone has seen that the personnel there, there are, let's say, Kurds from Turkey or Syria in restaurants and the hotel personnel are mostly from India and Nepal. And the more menial jobs are being done by people from China or Africa. So there's an enormously new ethnic division of labor in the region that deserves further study. The final point, and there I will stop then, is that there's also an important um, generation dimension to the political and economic developments of the region. In the aftermath of 1991, and especially in the aftermath of the uh, settlement of the 2003 war, an entire generation of Kurdish youth have grown up, and meanwhile have become adults, who have been used to the presence of this oil economy and have been used to the fact that a fixed percent of the oil revenue would reach the Kurdistan region and would be divided by, let's say, unknown means. They've been educated in the expectation that the oil economy would supply them. One of the big questions is why once this system and its associated expectations started faltering in 2014 at the latest, if not 2011 with the start of the uh, Arab Spring, why was it no sustained protest? Was it just a matter of loyalty to the Kurdish leadership? Was it just a matter of um, repression? Was it a matter of successful deflecting attention from the government policies to external actors like either the Iraqi government or IS? It's an open question. A related question is why, unlike in Turkey and Syria, Kurdistan region of Iraq does not have the, let's say, the, the urban, young, radicalized proletariat that can serve as a pool of resources and personnel for guerrilla warfare. There's a big difference there. And the astonishing thing was, of course, in the run-up to the referendum, uh, there would be stadiums full of young Kurdish men saying that they would be willing to sacrifice their blood for the region. But of course, once a conflict with the actual Iraqi army broke out, nothing of a mass mobilization of these youth occurred. So I suspect something important has happened there which I think, again, is a structural phenomenon that shouldn't be blamed on any one generation or individual, even political party. Outsiders always object that the local Kurdish youth no longer have a work ethic, which probably is correct, but again, they've been brought up in the expectation that they need not do a proper job to get uh, or not work their way up in the social ladder. So you can ask whether the co local political economy has involved the case of gentrification or bourgeoisification, or whether a new form of precariat has developed in which whatever affluence people have can be destroyed at any moment. And I suspect actually the latter may be the case because again, all the institutional things that fix and make secure economic life in the region, even things as basic as insurance or let's say a government a sovereign wealth fund to absorb political shocks simply is not present in the region. As a result of that, um, and here I, I finish with the topic of, let's say, gender and sexuality, in the younger generation, you find, on the one hand, a new form of social conservatism, which is not the same as a rise in, let's say, Islamic values, but a more conservative attitude that's quite widespread. And at the same time, you see an undermining of the traditional ideal of masculinity, which is of course that of the Peshmerga. So instead you find new forms of what has been called protest masculinity, 
which has been ridiculed by people as a form of middle class protest, but I think it's quite more significant than that. It may involve a change in the ideals of masculinity and femininity as a result of these enormous developments in local political economy. Thank you for your attention. Michael, thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank you for bringing social class analysis back to Kurdish studies, because I think this is essential. And I mean, it can also link Kurdish studies to broader literature, which is obviously about middle class and democratization, I think, which is still a very important connection. Uh, I just want to open the floor for questions and comments. I think it will be easier if we collect several questions from the audience and then we I direct them to our speakers. I mean, we can use the chat, um, or if you want to basically maybe speak up, that is also fine. Uh, I mean, I will maybe, as people maybe make up their thoughts, I can actually ask a question to both of you and then maybe we can wait until you get more questions and then you can answer those later. I can start with Michael. I mean, I, I know Michael, you also studied the Rojava, the Syrian Kurdistan. And I mean, when you look at the political economy of Rojava, it is even much more vulnerable, which is much more fragmented. So I will also wonder how we'll make a comparison between the Rojava, which is obviously a little bit different than Iraqi Kurdistan, because in Rojava, they have a much more explicit commitment to like a socialist, communalist ideal. And it's obviously another question how much they kind of try to practice in, in reality. But I will also appreciate your reflections about it. Uh, and then for um, Mesut, I mean, you talk about uh, whether this model is sustainable uh, based on basically the both external and domestic developments. Uh, I mean, domestic maybe a bit too speculative, so I am going to focus more on external developments. And I'm mean, easily just, I think, make a very good point about Turkish foreign policy being very revisionist since 2011. But I think before the, this conversation, we had this chat, and then, I mean, I think you are right in a sense, there is not much space left for Turkey to be revisionist. Because if you think about all the, like, the maybe adventurous foreign policy decisions taken by the Turkish government, there is not much left in terms of basically space. So it basically means that maybe they are kind of reaching more like a structural limit in terms of revisionism. And then if this is the case, then what will be the implication in the foreseeable future? Um, but yeah, let's basically maybe try to get more questions from our audience and then you can always respond. So any questions maybe like through the chat box or again, like if you just want to speak up. I might uh, ask Michael to uh, further elaborate on the no military um, service obligation uh, because I never focused on that. I always think, when I think about the PESH, I think separately. Um, thank you, Michael. Excellent statistics and stuff that I hadn't uh, thought about before. Other questions? Or maybe we can basically let Michael and Mesut respond to these questions and then we can obviously have one more tour. Uh, Michael, do you want to maybe start? Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for these wonderful questions. Um, each of, of them would deserve a much longer analysis, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, Joe Rita's questions about statistics, actually, there, there are some statistical materials available, but uh, they, they have not really yet been used. So uh, there have been several United Nations and other aid agencies that have been conducting some kinds of surveys and these are i think publicly available and they can be used if only with a bit of caution but um, again even if you're not able to do local field work yourself it's possible to use you uh, published materials um the interesting thing with uh, the peshmerga and iraqi kurdistan is of course that they're generally a a professional militia that is, people are being paid to serve in the Peshmergas. It's not simply a matter of military service or of, um, let's say, volunteering for the fatherland. Uh, partly, but that's not the whole story, of course, partly because the Peshmerga forces are still very much linked to the political parties rather than to the government at large. So um, you could see that also in, in the aftermath, for example, of the 2017 referendum, some of the Peshmerga forces were clearly under the command of PUK commanders and other were under KDP commanders. But I think there's a big difference between this system 
And of course, for a long time, the, the, the Iraqi Kurds did not have the need for anything like military service. Uh, but compare that to the situation in Baku or, or in Rojava. Um, of course, opponents will say that PKK forces or pro-PKK forces are kidnapping kids. But of course, they themselves will say, well, we are defending our nation and we are having some like an obligatory military service. So it's very different. And in that sense, I, I do think Iraqi Kurdish society has demilitarized in an important sense that young males are no longer obliged to do anything like military service, either for the Iraqi government or for the Kurdistan regional governments, which I think is a huge difference. And well, as anybody who has done military service in any of any country involved or somebody who like me has actually failed to do military service. Uh, doing military service is very much linked to questions of masculinity. So I think there's a structural reason for why there's this change in values of masculinity and femininity. Um, Ganesh's question about Rojava is a, it's a very important but a very difficult one also. Uh, I have not yet been able to, to visit Rojava in the past few years. Uh, last year was pretty close, but uh, didn't quite manage to. Uh, I have been in that region, which at that time was still called the Jazeera in the 1990s quite, quite a number of times. But of course, things have changed now. Um, one question that I simply cannot answer quite correctly is, um, of course, there's a lot of talk about the region being under this anarcho-syndicalist um, regime and grassroots government and so on, which is, of course, paralleled with a very strictly hierarchical and call it Leninist structure in the military. But I do think that at the local level, there are clear called up grassroots initiatives and cooperative initiatives, but I simply have no, um, no detailed and critical information as to how this system of democratic autonomy functions in practice at the local level. So I, I would love also to be able to go there and ask let's say local people, how their shops function, so to speak. I mean, questions as basic as those, not asking government representatives, but asking local business people or farmers what they do on a daily, daily basis <clears throat> can give an enormously enriched picture of what's going on in these regions economically. So thanks for the, the question and sorry for not being able to answer in more detail on that one. Mesut, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Ganesh, uh, for the question. Yeah, yes, uh, I basically agree with you. Uh, I also tend to think that this revisionism has come to a kind of limit. Okay. Uh, it's going to be, in other words, more difficult okay, to sort of be as aggressive as, I mean, as Turkey, for Turkey to, have, to be as aggressive as she has been. But on the other hand, uh, when you look at uh, piece by piece, uh, you can still say that, okay, there are still some spaces within which Turkey can move towards this or that direction. For instance, in the Mediterranean, there is this Cyprus thing and Turkey has still not played all the cards, okay, that uh, she has in her hands, okay. Uh, in Libya, there is a kind of resettlement, but we don't know whether it's going to uh, be uh, kind of maintained, okay? If you look at Syria, as long as US and Russia uh, uh, sort of retain uh, their current positions, I think, yes, Turkey cannot go any further than this, but I'm kind of scared that uh, if a kind of or rapprochement takes place between the US and Turkey again, then Russia can sort of open some space for Turkey to move kind of further, okay, in order to kind of uh, maybe provoke or in fact invite, okay, Turkey. So in Syria, things are kind of unclear, but if you look at the same issue from a kind of macro perspective, I think it's even uh, easier to say that yes, Turkey is coming to a kind of uh, limit because I think EU and the EU US will not be as tolerant as they have been uh, uh, to, towards Turkey in the coming uh, 
uh, months. Okay, so I think uh, as Turkey is experiencing this financial crisis nowadays, uh, it's going to be even riskier. Okay, to sort of challenge U.S. and the EU in the region. Okay, so as long as Turkey does not sort of take the risk of having even a kind of deeper, okay, or, or a kind of bigger, okay, financial crisis, then I think uh, Turkey will not, okay, dare to challenge EU and the US. So, yes, I think uh, in 2000, starting from 2021, Turkey, I think, will start to follow a kind of uh, moderate, I think, path, I should say. We have a question from Rashid Boazi, Boazi. Uh, maybe sort of for mispronouncing your surname, but um, he says it's a question to Michael. Uh, thank you for pointing the role of higher education in nation building in Iraqi Kurdistan. I saw that as a teacher to many Kurds who came to have who had come to the United Kingdom to study. A question to both, actually, actually to both of you. Do you think that the elites in Iraqi Kurdistan are genuinely striving for independence when they are clearly not in control of many factors that had put them in power in the first place? And I mean, maybe just to give a bit more contextualization to the question. There were some also controversies when the referendum decision was taken back in 2017, because some people were cynical in the sense that the argument is that the Barzani administration having the referendum not necessarily try to push for independence, but basically having more leverage vis-a-vis -vis the Baghdad government. So that has been also a bit controversial uh, back by the time. So, I mean, Michael, Mesut, if you want to reflect on this question, please do so. Masood, you want to go ahead first? Please, you go first. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, again, um, of, of course, the question of the referendum is it's a, it's a major one that has a couple, taken a lot of attention of uh, a lot of people. Um, again, um, if I make some critical comments on this, um, my, my support for and solidarity with the Kurds' moral rights to assert their self, self determination is not in, in discussion here. Um, but at the time, I was actually quite surprised to, to see this call for a, a referendum basically appearing very unexpectedly at the end of the IS war. And again, the timing of it should also uh, raise, a couple of, raise a couple of questions. Um, Usually when people ask, well, why have this referendum now, the rhetorical answer would be, well, why not now? When should it have been? In fact, uh, personally, I think it was in an important sense the, the wrong refer referendum at the wrong time, because in fact, a similar referendum had already been held in 2005 with completely similar results, and there nobody made much of it. Everybody expected it. So at the same time, the first ever post-Saddam elections were held in Iraq. Uh, there was a referendum in the Kurdistan region for independence. And of course, the vast majority voted in favor of it. But then with the 2005 constitution in Iraq, uh, there was actually a call for several referendums in the so-called contested regions. And these referendums asking the local population whether they want to be attached to the Kurdistan region or the Iraq the, the Baghdad government was never actually answered. And I think um, one of the strategic mistakes of the Kurdish leadership was to assume that their de facto control of these areas was identical to a legitimate rule and to the assumption that they should be part of the Kurdistan region, which I think gave, gave the Baghdad government a tool in their hands. Uh, another referendum I think should have been held much earlier is the fact of um, the ratification of the regional constitution in the Iraqi Kurdistan region, because the Kurdistan region has a constitution, but it has never been ratified. And I think the second referendum would have been even easier to hold than the first one, but for some reason it was never actually held. So this is on the level of, let's say, constitutional law that uh, one can make a few questions in it. Dr. Masood, I give the floor to you also. Thank you. To be honest, uh, I prefer not to speak about um, the referendum thing simply because I'm not an expert on the issue. I mean, I have some personal views, but I don't know if they're of any 
significance for the audience there. So I prefer not to speak because I, I didn't follow the issue there too closely, okay? Um, so yeah, as I'm not an expert, let me skip this question. Huh? Uh, we have one more question and maybe I can ask this and then if there's any more question, maybe we can take it before we uh, wrap up our event. So this question comes from Jordan Clark Hayes. So it's actually two different questions, but maybe they're related. So it's also to Michael. So I think uh, the, the first part is, and you can also see it in the chat, Michael, uh, is more about uh, starting with your examples of grocers and barbers who, as I think you suggested, may not be making a living from this endeavors. So maybe he wants more elaboration than how they basically earn their lives. And the second question is, he also says that there has been some protests in the KRG, uh, specifically I think in Suleimania. I, I also know that there were some protests back in 2011, 2012. Uh, so then the question becomes then, is it because, I mean, the protests did not become very successful because of repression, because of like security forces cracking them on down or, but I think your broader point is that there were protests, but then they never reach a stage where there was a huge mass mobilization, which could really have a more transport, transformative power in a sense. Uh, but yeah, please. Okay. Or, uh, are there more questions before maybe uh, we let our speakers last one? Yeah, Ambassador Galbert. Uh, please unmute yourself, yeah. I, I, I wanted to jump in on the question of the referendum because I happen to know something about it. Um, but the, the, the important point is that the 2017 referendum was an official referendum. So it was authorized by the Kurdistan parliament. Uh, it was a binding referendum. It wasn't self-executing, but it was binding. Um, whereas, uh, and carried out by the uh, Independent Election Commission, the Kur Kurdistan High Election Commission re and Referendum Commission. Whereas the 2005 referendum was organized by NGOs. It, it was uh, held outside of the polling places. And while it was a reflection of Kurdish opinion, it can't be considered uh, a, a, refer a, a the kind of referendum that under international law would justify independence. In terms of the timing, uh, clearly the uh, KRG ought to have declared independence in 2014. And they were moving to do that when um, Daesh took Mosul and before the August attacks. Uh, but then Secretary of State John Kerry came uh, just a few days after that, after the fall of Mosul. And he said, basically, we know what you want, just don't do it right now. And um, I think, uh, unfortunately, they listened to him. Um, but, uh, and, and the reason for doing it in 2017 was that the war against Daesh was wrapping up. Uh, there was a sense that there had been a promise to do it in 2015, uh, 2014. Um, of course, it was a different American administration, uh, but that the, that the opportunity to do it was going to disappear. Thank you, Ambassador Galbert. Uh, so there's one more question and I shall ask it because then I will give you the last word to our uh, speakers. So it's, it's from Aslikaya. It's a question about basically the Turkoman Kurdish relations in Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, basically about the rights and situations of Turkmen under Kurdish authority. And I know that Michael has done some work on the minorities, so he can also be, uh, I think, maybe speak some words about it. But yeah, like the floor, like Michael, Mesut, you want maybe say your last words? Okay, thanks very much for these uh, questions. And actually, th they tie up nicely because um, regarding the, the first question posed by uh, Jordan Clark Hayes, actually, um, every time I have been in the region, uh, with no offense to any of my friends here in Kurdistan, I've generally tried to avoid contact with political leaders and talk to as many barbers and taxi drivers and let's say the, the, the small local actors as I could. Because again, you hear completely different stories and they need not add up to a coherent narrative, but they provide an interesting alternative. Uh, importantly, I've also been focusing on minorities and not simply on the, the Yazidis who have rightly and uh, quite justifiably caught a lot of attention. Um, the Turkmen's are, it's, it's actually a quite vague label for a rather diffuse group of different people speaking different dialects and having different uh, sectarian identities. Um, the important thing in 2014, and this is really crucial to keep in mind, is that the relation between the KRG and these minorities was already quite, quite problematic. So not only 
the KRG attitudes towards the Yazidis in Sinjar area and in the Shekhan district, but also towards the Christians and the Shabak and different Turkomans groups in both Tel Afra region and also um, importantly in the Hamdaniya area, so east of Mosul. Uh, there had actually been popular protests against KRG presence in the region. So these people clearly felt treated as second class citizens by the KRG. And my hunch is actually that the fact that IS attacked these regions has something to do with that. The fact that they quite clearly attacked regions that were populated predominantly by minorities that are not seen as unproblematically or 100% Kurdish or as completely loyal to the KRG. It was of course very specific to IS tactics to employ such differences and to employ such sources of dissatisfaction. And sure enough, they were quite successful in doing so, both in the case of Mosul and in the case of Sinjar and, uh, and Nainuit Plain. So I think the, the, the sectarian policies and the minorities policies have been quite important in the story. Um, again, we, we can talk a lot more about the international legal dimensions of the, the referendum in 2017. Um, but there is also this, this rather more complicated background in local minorities policies, which I think should not be uh, left out of the, the story. Um, I think with that, yeah, also source of information about local, local actors. Uh, I, I don't want to do any self-advertisement, but uh, I've actually published several papers where I try to describe in more detail what local economic actors do. So the references in the back of my PowerPoint presentation, you can get some more detail. Again, I don't pretend to be an economist, but um, literally everything you hear in the area from any local actor is going to sound interesting and enrich your image and your view of what the local economy is like. And th this particular point about let's say grocers not making a living from their, uh, from their sales. Of course, a lot of locals do get something of a pension, but the big interesting question is where exactly do they get this pension from? Do they get it from the institutions of the regional government? Do they get it from a local party official? Or do they get it from a patron in a more informal sense? I think that difference is quite important and again, I don't know of any recent research that tries to elaborate or to explore these forms and patterns of patronage. So again, it's, I hope it's more an invitation to more detailed field work than uh, an assertion that I know all the details of how it's actually working. So thanks for all your input and your questions. Thanks much. Uh, Mesut, do you want to say maybe last words? You are fine? Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah, maybe that last question, yeah, Dr. Ghazi, go on, please. Uh, you, you know, Michael, uh, I, I appreciate both of you. I think you, you got to shed some important light on the situation back home. And uh, clearly, I agree with in regard of uh, the referendum initially, why 2017, because if you look at it, Baghdad did not embark on Hawija, suburb of Kirkuk. They left it to the very end with the hope to clear up Hawija and to go to directly to Kirkuk. It was well planned and the Kurdish leadership was aware of it. The second question to you, why do you think if minority think that the Kurds were prejudiced against them, then why all Christians escaped from all over Iraq and took refugee in the Kurdish region? Not just Christian, but also Sunni Arab, Shiite Arab, Shabak and Turkmen already live there anyway. So this is my question about, I'm, I'm really somewhat surprised to hear that. Now, there were Christian in the suburb of Mosul who are big time pro Saddam at that time. And clearly they were with Saddam. But when it came to Daesh and the situation over there, they came and were uh, greeted with open arms. So I'm somewhat surprised to hear that all these minority are not happy with KRG. Okay, thanks for these questions. Again, I, I don't pretend to be a specialist on the, the, let's say the constitutional and international law aspects of the referendum, but uh, one important aspect that I saw when, let's say in the run up to the referendum, I was there shortly after and shortly before also, 
And I was there when the first plans were announced in, I think, May of 2017. Um, personally, I'd actually thought that the KRG had agreed to participate in the war to oust IS on condition of some kind of uh, compensation or concessions by the Baghdad government, if not perhaps even the, the United States. But a bit to my surprise, I have never seen any concrete indication that any such deals were made beforehand. And also, I was surprised by the fact that this plan for a referendum was announced in May of 2017 and pushed through very quickly um, without any international diplomatic effort preceding it. So it was only then, apparently, that diplomats representing the Kurdistan regional government in America, in Europe, became active that Kurdish delegates from the region visit the different European countries and generally they got a negative answer to their uh, pleas. But I was really surprised that it hadn't been prepared over a longer period of time. So it does seem to have, so to speak, occurred on the spur of a moment. Regarding the question of the minorities, um, I have actually visited numerous refugee camps in the region repeatedly, uh, focusing actually on the minorities. And uh, I've actually written about this in several papers. Um, what you do see is that, yes, a lot of people have, of course, fled to the Kurdistan region. Uh, in the case of Yazidis, some have fled to Syria in the aftermath of the, the attack on Sinjar in particular. But in the Kurdistan region, very problematic things have happened. And of course, it's not to belittle the efforts that have been made by the regional government. Um, but with some of these minorities, um, what you do see that, again, there's partly unresolved land conflicts in this Nineveh plain underlying some of these, uh, these population transfers. And also what I have observed is that um, in some of the camps near Erbil city, um, I forgot the precise names that I've written down somewhere. In one of these, you, f you saw a big mixture of Sunni Arabs from Baghdad, um, Yazidis, Shabak, Turkmens, and you name it, even a couple of Palestinians were there. Uh, there was another camp nearby, and it was right next to, to Ain Kaaba, in fact. Um, the Christians were actually lucky, relatively speaking, because they came to Ain Kaaba, um, resettled in a, an abandoned shopping mall. So the conditions of their camp was actually much better than those of, uh, let's say, the Shabak and the Yazidis in the region. Moreover, and this is one of the paradoxes, is that the people fleeing Nineveh area were still entitled to an allowance they received from the Baghdad government. So at the time when the Kurdistan regional government was not able to pay salaries, these refugees would actually be financially be better off than the local population, which again, it is something quite odd. A final point that I've actually observed personally is that um, one of these camps was actually settled by Shebek. Um, and it was there in December of 2014 and it was, it was really a miserable place. I visited again in the summer of 2015, and to my surprise, all Shabak had left. And I've heard different stories, but um, one story says that were actually, they were encouraged by the regional government to take an airplane to the south of Iraq. And indeed, nowadays, a lot of the Shabak have migrated further to the south of Iraq and have be basically been dissolving into the 12 Shiite community. So again, um, without pretending to give a full picture, there have been very dramatic um, a very destructive effects on all of these minorities, none of which is necessarily intended by any of the local actors, but the consequence for all these groups have been quite, quite horrible. Sorry to end on such a negative note, but uh, it's, it's, it is, of course, a very sad story. So maybe to end the session in a positive note, and thanks much, very much for this engaging and very informed discussion. Uh, I just want to say that we just want to remember Dr. Najm Altan Kerim, and I am hoping that his legacy is going to live uh, via uh, basically many other things, but also through our programs at UCF. Uh, Kerstin, do you want to maybe say a final word before we close off the event? Yes, so this has really been uh, really interesting. I learned a lot. It's really been an honor to have the speakers, to have um, the friends and, and colleagues of Dr. Karim who helped us um, remember him and, and shared the thoughts about him. Um, you know, it is the week before Thanksgiving, and so thank you for all, for all, to all of you for uh, spending some time with us today. I know it's a busy time 
for everybody. I know Thanksgiving is not a universal concept, but it certainly is still an important holiday here in the US, although it's a little different this year. But anyway, um, you know, just thank you again. And we hope that we will be able to, to honor the legacy of Dr. Kareem through the fellowships, through our continued uh, work with the Kurdish Political Studies Program. And um, just I hope you're all safe and stay well. And again, Mesut and Michael, thanks much. Our pleasure absolutely. to be here. And our, absolutely. And our, of course, our wonderful speakers. So thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Good afternoon or good evening to everybody. Thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye.